a long ways off, but let me go ahead and give you some info. Uh, settled today, talked to another preacher about coming doing a revival for us. It'll be the second week in November. So Sunday through Wednesday, starting the 10th, ending up on Wednesday at 13th. And so be much in prayer and Michael Hewitt. He's the pastor at Sabbath Home. So be much in prayer for him. Pray that God will give him the messages that we need. Amen. Anyone else have an announcement? How about a prayer request? We heard all the requests this morning, and let's keep those in mind. We all have a bulletin. Make sure you keep those as listed on our hearts and keep them up in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Brother David Howe, would you lead us a prayer concerning these prayer requests? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be back in your house. We just thank you for all the blessings that you give us each and every day that we're not even aware of, dear Lord. And we just ask that you be with each and every one that's here tonight, dear Lord. And be with our pastors who bring us a message tonight, too, dear Lord. And just let us open our hearts and our minds to it, dear Lord. We just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Kale, you feel like singing again? <laughs> I said that, he started sliding down that chair. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
You don't have to say the words. What can you do? Yes. He said volunteer, didn't he? share Can you bring me up here? You got to say this She literally used to do this about 40 years ago. I'm not exactly right. another first sense
Well, if this, if you're not practicing this, you sang so many songs from baby wow. mountains. <laughs> <laughs> that was a blessing. Hey, thank you. Forty years, and now she come up and been that out of forty years. I'm not exaggerating. Just been at least. That's been for some. Next Sunday, Tori, you can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank y'all for doing that. That's a blessing to me. How about y'all? Well, tonight we're going to go back into Romans chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 13 through 25 and a whole lot more. And so if you have your Bibles, you can look with us. It'll be posted up on the screen as well, the scriptures. I uh, sent Tao a screenshot of all the scriptures I'm going to use tonight and how they're going to go in order. And I said, you don't have to use these. I'm just letting you know this is what I'm going through. Well, he did them all, and he said, it took me an hour to do that. <laughs> but he's a blessing to us, amen? So appreciate what Tao does, and not only for us here at the church, but for those that's at home that are watching through Facebook. They see all the scriptures as well as we go through it. So let's begin in prayer, and then we'll get started in our Bible study in message form tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we do ask your blessings upon this study, and pray as we go through the book of Romans, it will be a blessing to us, and I know Paul deals a whole lot uh, with works and law and with grace and with justification. And then as we move further into the book, he'll get on some other topics as well. I pray, Lord, it'll be precious to us as we go through this scripture that we'll learn things we have not been taught before and we'll be reminded of things that maybe we already knew. And then, Father, we just want to give you glory and praise and pray that it touches us in a special way. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I uh, mentioned this morning that this morning's message was a good introduction to our message for tonight because it deals ma mainly with the same subject. And so let's just get right into it. We're going to look at verse 13 to start with. Romans 4, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. And so Paul, in writing the scriptures and what we've been learning for the last few messages in great detail, he is appealing to the Jews of his day and he brings up the life of Abraham to make a certain point that we are saved not by works, but simply by faith, by justification. And so he's trying to teach his readers that salvation is purely the gift of God. He has already taught us in a previous message that works cannot save the soul. He has also mentioned that circumcision cannot save the soul. Tonight we're going to learn, uh, as we study deeper into God's Word, that keeping the law cannot save the soul as well. We've been talking a lot about the law versus justification. And when you think about it, the law didn't come to be until the time of Moses, which was 430 years after the time of Abraham. And so he had no law to deal with. And so we need to understand that. That means the law was not established till 430 years after Abraham. So Abraham never had the law. He was justified without the law. Justified without the law. Now the promise given to Abraham is that he should be the heir of the world to come. That he would have a lot of heirs come after him. He would be the father of many nations. It was given by God to Abraham because of his faith and because of his belief in God's word. And so it is basically a threefold promise we're going to see in the scripture tonight. The key to understanding these verses is to know that Paul is thinking about the special promises that God gave to Abraham, a promise that had three distinctive parts to it. A land promise, a seed promise, and a blessing promise. Now God promised to make Abraham the father of a great nation and to give that nation a land of its own and to bring great blessing to the world through Abraham and his descendants. Now Canaan was the promised land. 
We sang about Canaan this morning in our very first song, the choir come out. And so the Canaan land is not only a physical place, but many times we use it in reference to that heavenly place that we're yearning to go to, yearning to be in. And so Canaan has always been pictured in songs and in poems as the land of promise, a type of heaven on earth. I want to read you several scriptures that deal with the land promise of Abraham, the land of Canaan. So let's turn in Genesis in chapter 12, verses 1 through 7 to begin with. Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 7. It'll be on the board as well. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So there's the three promises right there. And we're going to come back to these verses in just a few moments. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed, as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth and go into the land of Canaan. Into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, and unto the plain of Mori. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now the land of Canaan, you might wonder, is it still in existence? Well, sure it is. It's the land of Israel today. Parts of Israel, parts of Palestine make up the land of Canaan. And that's why there's such a division between the Arabs and between the Middle East and, and the Jewish people because of the land of Canaan that was promised to God. But they had to drive out the Canaanites and all the other ites as well. There's a lot of those ites out there. But he had to drive them all out. And, and even in Joshua's time, they still had not driven them all out. But that's why there's such a struggle. Because God promised the land of Canaan to Abraham and his descendants. And it is where the land of Israel is today. Now let's look at some more scriptures concerning the land of Canaan. Look in chapter 13, verses 12 through 17. Chapter 13, 12 through 17. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. And the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said to Abram, After that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. What land are we talking about? Canaan. Canaan land. Look in Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. Genesis 17, 1 through 8. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram, and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, he is still yet to have a child. But God said, A father of many nations, have I made thee? It's as good as done. When God promises something, you can count on it. And so it's still a year away before he has his child. He's 99, has the child at the age of 100. And I will make thee exceedingly 
fruitful and I will bring make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God and so God has promised I'm giving you this land and I'm giving your descendants that come after you they shall keep this land once again if you look on the map in the back of your Bible and you look up Canaan and then if you look up Canaan where it's located and then the present day you'll see it's the land of Israel that is where God promised his people now let's look up one more scripture in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 10 Hebrews 11 8 through 10. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And so once again, we see the promise that God has given Abraham, not only will be for him, but for his descendants to come after him, even unto this present day. It's the land of Israel, Canaan land. Now this also points, when we look at the scripture back in Romans, it also points to the seed promise, which is Jesus Christ. Not only Abraham was the forefather of Jesus. When you think about it, the earthly, uh, through the earthly line, Mary, uh, all the way back to Abraham. And so we see that the lineage all the way through from Abraham down to David, Solomon, all the way through to Mary is the line of Abraham. And so Jesus Christ, he will inherit this earth one day and he comes back to that great event is the rapture. He'll call us out. But then seven years later, the second coming, he'll come back, we'll come back with him, and he'll set up his rule and reign on this earth. And you and I, as the New Testament church, will rule and reign with him, joint heirs with Christ. What a wonderful day it's going to be. Now, as the seed of Abraham, in Romans chapter 4, look back at verse 11 for just a minute. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe though they be not circumcised that unrighteousness might be imputed unto them also and so when we're talking about the seed of Abraham in verse 11 tying in with all the rest of the chapter it's speaking about you and me being a part of that so we become the seed of Abraham as well because it's not just the circumcision it's the uncircumcision as well that means the Jew and the Gentile it's not based on physical circumcision it's based on faith when we trust in God when we trust in God's work of salvation for you and me through Jesus Christ then we are accounted as the seed of Abraham as well and so we are heirs of righteousness, will rule and reign with Christ when he sets up his kingdom and his throne on this earth. Now this promise, as I mentioned a while ago, was initially given back in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Let me read that once again, then we'll move on. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so that promise becomes the foundation for the sending of Christ into the world some 2,000 years after Abraham. So when Paul talks about the promise to Abraham, we need to understand he's talking about the promise of salvation for you and for me in our day and time. So this promise points ahead to the coming of Jesus 
When He came and He lived and He died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, resurrected from the dead, and because of that, when we go to Him and we ask forgiveness of our sins, we are forgiven and we are saved and born again, and because of His resurrection from the tomb, we have eternal life and we'll live with Him forever and forever. And so we too do not receive the inheritance through the law, but by faith. We don't receive the inheritance through the law, but by faith, by righteousness. Only then does God accept our belief and count it as righteousness. Abraham was justified not by keeping the law, but by righteousness, by his faith. Not obeying the law, but by trusting God. And it's the same way with you and me. We're not saved by obeying the law. The law shows us just how wicked we are. The law shows us our need of salvation. No, when we come to God in faith, then He accounts righteousness upon us and we become saved. This promise also points to Abraham being the human vessel through which others will be blessed by. All the nations of the world, his descendants, will be a blessing to others that live on this earth. And we see that playing out in our very day and time in which we live. One of our greatest allies, greatest friends that we have is Israel. And so we see it playing out right before our eyes. But do you know that we that are also born of the family of God, we can be channels of blessing through which others can be blessed as well. God uses us and what gifts and talents and, and the things that He has appropriated towards our lives, and we can use these things to bless other people. And so the New Testament church is a blessing to others too when we operate in the Spirit of God and move as He would have us to. Amen? Now look... Look at Romans 4, verses 14 through 16. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Amen. Now, if a person can live the law perfectly in every aspect, then he would have no need of a Savior. If you could live the law without ever sinning in your entire life, you wouldn't need a Savior at all. Law voids faith. Let me say that again. Law voids faith. And if that's so, then it erases any hope of receiving the promise. Listen, if it is works, then it is not grace. And if it is grace, it is not works. Because works can't save you. Only grace can when we operate in faith towards God. The law was not given to save men, but to show them they need to be saved. To show us how we cannot measure up to the law. The law was a schoolmaster until Jesus Christ come to this earth. And we accept Jesus, His accomplished work on Mount Calvary by faith. And that's what puts us into the family of God. Amen. Now, Faith, we are told, is what makes a difference in overcoming the world. We find in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so you want to overcome the world? You want to overcome the flesh? You want to overcome the wiles of the devil? It is faith in God. That brings us to a place where we can overcome the world. Faith, we are told, is what pleases God. We find in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, these words. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So the Bible tells us, if we do not express faith, there's no way in pleasing God. It is when we express our faith, that's when God is pleased with us. That's what brings him glory when we express our faith. Faith, we are told, is how we are saved. The scripture teaches us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so it's not of works, Paul plainly says that, it's simply faith in God. When we turn ourselves over to God in faith, that's how we become saved, amen? So what then is faith? Think about that. It's not believing things will work out. I say, well, I sure hope things work out. Nah, that got nothing to do with faith. huh? Uh, faith is not the power of positive thinking. You may be the most positive person in the world, but that's not faith. And, and faith is not thinking God can because that's not belief wholeheartedly in God. No, it is knowing God will. And faith, when it's all said and done, is taking God at his word. We take God at his word. That is what made Abraham such a wonderful human being. He took God at his word, and God blessed him tremendously. If you want to be blessed by God, take him at his word. Amen? Now, if you read about the life of Abraham, you'll realize he was not a perfect person. He has some flaws. If you'll read his life in the Old Testament, you'll see that him and his wife went over somewhere. He was afraid for his life, and he told his wife, look here, say you're my sister. Don't say you're my wife, because they're going to take my neck, and they're going to they're gonna kill me. But if you'll say you're my sister, and so he was trying to get out of being killed, and and so it was, well, it was a half-truth. She was his half-sister, but, but a half-truth doesn't make a whole lie, does it? It makes a whole lie. And so he told a half-truth. So he wasn't perfect. He had flaws in his life as well. But if you look over in the New Testament, none of that is recorded. Only thing recorded in the New Testament concerning Abraham is his faith. How he was accounted righteous because he took God at his word. Amen. And that gives hope for you and for me too. Because I know for myself, I'm not perfect either. I know it surprises you. But I'm not perfect. But I got news for you. You're not perfect either. Not in 100% capacity are you perfect in God's eyes. Now I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But what it is that makes us right in God's eyes is our faith. When we express faith in God, He loves us and accepts us through the family. Aren't you glad for that? Faith is our response to the promises of God. Look in verses 17 through 22. Back in Romans chapter 4. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, show, so shall thy show, <laughs> so shall thy seed be. I finally got it out. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone. Well, let me stop with that. Therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now these verses we've just read teach us that Abraham was not justified by any act he had ever committed, any work he had ever done, but rather in his faith in believing God. Amen. So Abraham was old. 
He was an old man when the promise of a child came for him and Sarah. As we mentioned this morning, no doubt they had tried to have a child from the time they were young people, even into their middle age years, and now they were old, and Sarah had given up any claim to having a child, as we had talked about this morning. But Abraham still stayed stuck on it because God promised he believed God with his old heart. Now it took Sarah a little bit longer, but she finally got the message, and she finally believed in faith as well. Now, one reason God didn't answer their prayer right away because simply there, he wanted to wait till their natural strength declined. And it seemed like there was no hope, humanly possible, that they could have a child, that Sarah could conceive. It was unthinkable that a man 100 year old and his wife, nine years old, could conceive and give birth to a child. But Abraham did not walk by sight. He walked by faith. Amen. He walked by faith. It was the faith that gave him the strength to keep trusting God. No matter what obstacles lay before him, no matter how long time kept going on, he still trusted God that he was going to have a child. And so the message is clear. God waits until the sinner is unable to help himself before God can use him and save his soul. Now looking back in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Paul states that God brings to life things that are dead and he makes something out of nothing and that certainly pertains to Abraham he was old there is no way humanly possible he could pass seed on to Sarah and have a child they were past the childbearing years he was dead as far as giving a child he was there was nothing within him but God made something out of that. Amen? And so his faith in God, he trusted in God, and the result is one day he come out of the childbirth tent, he looked at everybody around, and he shouted out, It's a boy! And everybody was so glad for him because they knew how much they had wanted a child. And he expressed his faith, It's a boy. Now God also brings to life things that are dead in our lives. God also brings something out of nothing when we were dead in trespasses and sins. We find in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, the words that pertain to me and you. Listen to what it says, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So many times we hold our past against ourselves. But God says, you were like that at one time, but now you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are justified in the sight of God. And what God is called clean, call not unclean. Amen. Now, back in verse 18 of Romans 14, look what it says. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So verse 18 states that hope is the belief that God will do what he said he would do. We believe God will do what he said he would do. And Abraham, with all that he had going against him, Father time moving on in his life, becoming old, and all the obstacles he had. He still believed in God. 
He believed in his word and he believed in hope. And he grabbed a hold unto God's word. You're going to have a child. It's as good as done. And Abraham believed it. He still didn't have that child. Not at that time, but he still believed it. He believed God and his word and he trusted in God. How about you? When we read all through the Bible, the many promises of God, some Bible scholars say there's over 30,000 promises that God has given us in his holy and precious word. But how is your hope when you trust in God's word? When things haven't come to pass yet as you had desired them to be, do you still have that hope that God's going to deliver and make good? See, there are thousands of promises in his word he gives to his believers, such as, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise from God that he'll always be with us, no matter what obstacles or troubles we face. Or how about he will lift our burdens and we need to cast our burdens from upon him because he will lift us up in our time of deepest sorrow and burdens? Or how about protecting us in times of trouble or always answering us when we call out to him? All these are promises and even more. On and on we could go, but we all need to have that hope, that hope to trust in God. Now our main hope is in Jesus Christ. We find in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, these words. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. God is looking for some people to bestow his goodness upon. Now, let's close it out with verses 23 through 25 back in Romans 4. 23 through, through 25. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if, notice that word, if, we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The Bible tells us that Abraham's faith was imputed to him for righteousness, but it also adds not for his sake alone, but for our sake as well. Amen? So it adds our sake, but then there's a condition. If we believe if we believe now first of all when we believe God and his word we go to him with our sins and we ask him to forgive us our sins we acknowledge our sin we acknowledge we're a sinner in need of a savior and we confess our sin before God that's what the term offenses mean our sins is what nailed Jesus to the cross. Amen? And so we need to give Jesus adequate resource of our sin. Then it also says, if we believe, not only believe that Jesus died on the cross, took our place, bore our death on Calvary, but then we must also believe that God raised him from the dead. Amen? When he resurrected from the grave, he justified each and every one that will trust in him as they come to him for forgiveness. But some find it so hard to ask for forgiveness. They simply cannot believe that God would choose to save us simply by faith. It's just too simple for a lot of people. A lot of people think there's got to be so much more to it to get saved. But it's simple faith, trusting in God. One day a Bible teacher, evangelist, a wonderful man of God, R.A. Torrey, he spoke with a woman who had lacked the assurance that her sins were forgiven. He told her to read Acts 13, 37 through 39 out loud in front of him. And so she began reading, and this is what it says. 
But he whom God raised again saw new corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You missed that last slide there. There you go. And so when he read that scripture to the woman, or she read it back to him rather, Tor asked her, now what does God say is justified? She says, everyone who believes. He asked her, believe on whom? She says, believe on Christ. Then Tori asked her, have you accepted him as your Savior and Lord? And she replied, yes, I have. Then what does this verse promise? But in her doubtful state, she could not repeat and could not say, I'm justified from all things. She just couldn't believe that God would save her soul and justify her. And so Tori went over the scripture with her again and again. And again, and at last the simple words dawned on her and she said, praise God, I believe I'm justified from all things. She finally experienced the peace that comes from knowing she is. And we wonder, self-effort, no matter what rituals you, agonizing prayer cannot take away sin. None, none of that will work. It's when we trust Christ completely for salvation that we are justified and declared righteous by God. And then once that dawns on us, like it did with the woman with oratory, then we lose that burden of guilt and experience total justification. And then we can have real peace. A lot of people can't move on in their Christian life because they're tormented by their past. But folks, what God has forgiven, He has forgiven. And He doesn't hold it against you any longer. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. He was to remind you of your past, agonize you, you remind him of his future. He is doomed to a devil's hell and to the lake of fire and brimstone which he will one day be at. Micah 7, 19 says these words. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. When God forgives us of our sins, He throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. And then guess what? He posts a sign, no fishing. What God has forgiven, no man has a right to bring up. You and I are our worst critics when it comes to our own sin. But what God has forgiven, He is thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. And now just envision that sign, no fishing. No fishing allowed. God is truly forgiven. Isn't that wonderful news? It is for me, and I hope it is for you. Our Heavenly Father, as we close in prayer tonight, for whatever it is that nags at us, that keeps us from fully trusting you and realizing we are justified, not by our works, but rather by our faith, help us to hang on to that and to trust in you so we can move on in our Christian walk. And that we will glorify you in everything we take on from this day forward. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, you've heard the message. How will you respond? Let's all stand.
stories or comments you'd like to share? Anyone? Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you just hear the message? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Brother Barry, you close us in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for another day you've given us, God. Thank you for a wonderful morning service. The number we had here, thank you for the night service, dear God. Lord, just so much to be thankful for, God. You give us so much, Lord, and your word keeps us alive, Lord. And let us.